Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our One Word Seminar. Uh, today, I'm very happy to have uh, Jose here to give us a talk on his recent work on sparsity. Uh, and Jose uh, Gadio Pasada is a now a fifth PhD uh, uh, student at Miller University of Montreal, uh, supervised by Simon Laco uh, Laco Lacote uh, Julian, and also a visiting researcher at Meta. And before joining Mila, he completed his master in artificial intelligence at the University of Amsterdam uh, in 2018 uh, under the supervision of Patrick Foray. Uh, and Jose also holds a bachelor degree in uh, mathematical engineering from Uni uh, University EAFIT in Colombia. And without further ado, let's enjoy Jose's talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction, Wuyang. And thanks everyone for being here. Today, I'll talk to you about my recent work on control sparsity via constraint optimization. Uh, and we actually have a subtitle for this, and I hope to convince you by the end of the presentation, uh, at least nudge you in the direction of uh, perhaps trying to convince you to stop tuning penalties and love constraints, at least a little bit as much as I do. So the agenda for today, we're going to talk about um, training sparse neural networks and analyzing penalized and constraint formulations for, for learning sparse networks. I'll talk about a proposal of constraint sparsity, and I'll give a very brief introduction to a library that we're developing for handling constraint optimization problems in deep learning called Cooper. I first want to take some time to, to acknowledge all the great work from my collaborators. They're all from Pramila, uh, Juan, and Akram, our fellow PhD students, and we had the supervision of Joshua and Simon doing our work. Uh, so I just want to start by setting up some notation and kind of getting us all on the same page regarding the sparsity problem. So the, the setting that I'm considering is we're going to train a deep neural network with parameters theta, and we're going to train that over a particular um, labeled training set of X and Ys. And we sort of want to keep many of the entries of theta turned off. That's sort of the big premise of sparsity. So maybe we'll want to remove some of the connections within this, uh, this particular linear layer of a network. Or maybe we want to turn off full units. And there's many different flavors of sparsity. You can do it while you're training. You can do it after you have trained. Uh, it can be on structure, where you look at individual weights, or structure, where you look at perhaps units or channels, uh, output channels of your convolutional layers. Can do it on the weights or on the activations. This is, a, this is kind of a big uh, zoo or different flavors of, of sparsity that you can use. In the particular setting that we're going to consider in this paper, we'll do in training sparsity, where we are going to sparsify the weights of the neural network. And we're going to contrast the penalized and constrained approaches to solving this sparsity problem. Now, why do we care about sparsity or what's sort of the promises that sparsity can, can give to the deep learning community? First, in practice, we care about sparsity because it allows us to reduce the transmission and storage of, of big models. And especially now that models are getting bigger and bigger, uh, being able to transmit them efficiently and to store them efficiently is very important. And this is actually also connected to the latency for inference. If you have fewer weights that are active, uh, in your in your neural network, then you might be able to say trim some of those calculations that you now will not need to do because you know they're full of zeros, so you can skip them. And when we want to deploy these networks on device, uh, that can the smaller models can help reduce power consumption, and potentially also allow us to train larger models uh, or ch have cheaper training, if we potentially have this larger model that has uh, a sparse structure inside it. So we maybe don't even need to instantiate the sparse model, the, the fully dense model at all. From the theory standpoint, it's also interesting to study sparsity because uh, it helps us understand how or why deep neural networks work, and in particular, the role of over-parameterization. So we know that the many of the networks that we use nowadays have many more parameters than the size of the, of the training set that we are using to, to kind of adjust their parameters. And studying the study of sparsity can help us understand how over parameterization plays a role in learning and generalization. And this sort of hybrid, uh, I call it a hybrid uh, kind of setting where we want to understand what are the 
even the network designs are, let's say, residual networks or transformers? What is the specific network designs that are best suited to be trained in a sparse way? I'll start by um, kind of mentioning this high level perspective of uh, penalty based regularization, because it will kind of play a, a role later on in the talk. And the idea is that, as before, we're trying to minimize the training error, but now we'll want to impose some penalty that hopefully encourages a certain kind of behavior in our neural network. So maybe this penalty could be something like a weight decay or um, you know, different kinds of LP norm. But it, the, also the different kind of behavior could be more complex, like we might want to encourage, let's say, some entropy regularization in our policies in our app, or we might want to encourage uh, our network to be fair or to be robust to certain perturbations of the inputs. And this is sort of the standard way of training uh, models in, in deep learning. You have your training laws and whatever other kind of behavior you want to encourage, you're going to set up a pen, an additive penalty on the loss. You're going to augment the loss by choosing an appropriate regularizer. In particular, in the context of sparsity, a natural regularizer to have, if we want to have many of these units turned off, would be what's so-called the L0 norm. This is essentially, if you look at the weights of the network, we're going to count the number of weights that are non-zero. This is going to tell us how many of the units, are, how many of the weights are active. And so if we were to, let's say, normalize this by the total number of weights, this will give us a measure of the density of the network in terms of this kind of the active parameters that it, that it has. Uh, of course, as before, this lambda penalty, lambda pen here uh, determines the importance of this regularization versus the training loss that we had. When lambda pen is very small, close to zero, we're essentially discarding the regularization. And when it's very, very large, we just discard the training objective and we try to enforce more the behaviors encoded by the penalty. One particular problem about the L0, regul the L0 regularization is that it's non differentiable and it leads to a combinatorial problem uh, because you know, we have no, grad no, no useful gradients uh, with respect to the parameters when we have this, this sort of spiky, spiky function that is counting whether the parameter is on or off. When the parameter is non-zero, it's flat and it says one. And when the parameter is zero, the, the gradient is actually undefined. So that in principle would be a challenge for trying to solve these problems, but fortunately, uh, previous work by Luzos and collaborators proposes a differentiable reparameterization of the network that allows us to essentially get useful gradients for training a deep neural network with the LLC regularization. Now, even with that, let's say, the fix for getting gradients, there's a bunch of challenges with the approach of training networks with um, the, the penalized approach. The first one is if we have a specific target density in mind, how to tune the lambda parameter to achieve that desired density. So for example, let's say, let's show the picture on the right. We're trying to get to a target density of 50%. And one potential way we could do this is by potentially running a bisection algorithm for trying to find what the lambda pen should be. So we start with a you know, fairly small lambda pen, a fairly large, and then we carry on bisection to try to find at which lambda pen we could have found the target density that we want. Note that in this case, I'm not claiming that bisection is, is in, any, in any way the, the optimal method for, for solving this. But in this case, we had to evaluate this, this, this pipeline six times. And that means training the network from scratch with the different value of the lambda pen for each of the different configurations that we, that we observed uh, from the bisection algorithm. So that means training six different neural networks trying to find the value of lambda pen. This is a specific case of, of an MLP and MNIST. So in this case, the overhead is not too bad. These experiments are fairly cheap. But if you want to train a larger scale model, you don't want to do it six times to try to find a suitable value of the regularization parameter. Moreover, if you're, the problem that you're tackling is has certain non-convexity properties, it might be possible that certain of these density targets might not even be achievable by tuning the lambda pen. So there might be some values of target density for which there is no fixed lambda pen that can get you to that point. And you can check out this reference to understand why that's the case. And um, moreover, there are actually some, 
reported works uh, claim that it's they have not been able to get sparse models uh, that don't essentially just guess randomly when trying to use this L0 reparameterization for training sparse ResNets. So the proposal that we come up in this paper is to, instead of setting up the problem as a penalized objective, we propose to formulate these sparse goals as L0 norm constraints. So constraints on the L0 norm or the density of the parameters. And once we have this constraint optimization problem, we'll move on to solve the Lagrangian min-max problem associated with the constraint problem. So the big picture for a paper is that, let's say we're I'm here showing some results for a ResNet 18 model on the tiny ImageNet data set, and I'm comparing the constraint in blue, so that's all color-coded. Blue is the constraint method and red is a penalized method. And um, let's focus on the, on the first plot on the left. I'm setting up a specific target density, let's say of 40%, and I'm running the, the method that we're proposing. The details are to come next. Uh, but when we run it with a target density of 40%, we actually get to the achieved density of 40%. If we chose 50%, we get to 50% target density and so on. What we're showing here is that we're actually able to control this parsity that we wanted. And this actually happens in one shot, in a sense. We don't need to train this many different models as the bisection method for finding the, the lambda, lambda pen parameter. In fact, you can see the sort of the brittleness of the lambda pen parameter in the red stars over here. So what we're showing here is, what if I try to do that sort of this manual tuning of lambda pen? Suppose that I wanted to get to, to let's say 70%. So I first start with a relatively, relatively small lambda pen. And this is, is telling me for this specific choice of lambda pen, what was the achieved density? So I end up with about 90% density of the model. Now I go an order of magnitude higher to 10 to the minus three, and the density of the model doesn't really change. And now I go another order of magnitude and it changes to 80%. And if I were to go another order of magnitude higher, it all of a sudden just jumps to even below 40%. So there is no kind of clear correlation between the, like no clear indication of what sort of is the derivative of the density with respect to the lambda pen that you're choosing. It can either not change at all in this regime or change all of a sudden in a different regime for lambda. I want to make a quick disclaimer that we're not we're not claiming that the constraints are sort of universally superior to the penalized alternatives, but in certain applications, uh, these constraint formulations can allow you to have a hyperparameter with clear semantics. Because if you remember these plots over here, where we were setting is the target density of our model, which is sort of an interpretable quantity that you can get either because of you know problem problem constraints, you know you're going to deploy this model on a certain device and you can afford a certain number of flops. So you, you kind of have, have an idea of how many parameters you can afford in your network. Trying to interpret lambda pen is a lot more complicated. There's no sort of no clear intuitive understanding of what a specific value of lambda pen means besides the fact that, you know, higher lambda pen means in some sense more regularization. So you can get a hyperparameter with clear semantics. And of course, the hyperparameter in the constraint formulation would be the constraint level. And we can have more reliable control over the desired properties. As we showed before, we set 50% target density, we got 50% target density. And importantly, there is no essentially no uh, computational overhead to carrying out the constraint method compared to the penalized method. And I'll, sh I'll sh show why this is the case later when we discuss the algorithm. So with that disclaimer out of the way, I'll kind of quickly uh, revisit the proposal of Lucius et al. for, for training this L0 reparameterized models with actually useful gradients. So the idea is that instead of working with, the, let's say, the parameters directly, we're going to work with a sort of masked version of the parameters, where this theta tilt are free parameters, it's the actual magnitude of the parameters. And then this Z is going to be a stochastic mask that is going to tell us whether the parameter is active or not. Now, of course, if Z was just binary, then we would still sort of be in the same problem 
where when we try to compute the gradient with respect to the parameters, it would still be it would still be uh, non-differentiable. So the idea that they have is to to propose a stochastic distribution that parameterizes that with this new parameters phi. So in a sense, theta now is described by the parameters theta tilde and phi that govern the, the gates. And these gates now are going to live in the interval zero one. So the gates are in essence non-binary non and that's going to allow us to get useful gradients. And so the, eventually because the gates are stochastic, now we have a distribution over the possible models. So we, since we don't have a single model, what they propose is to consider the, the expected loss. So out of all the possible gates, what's the expected loss that I would have seen given this magnitude parameters theta tau? And of course the penalty coefficient. And so this is essentially the expected loss that we had before plus the penalty coefficient times the expected L0 norm. And in this case, this is expected because again, the, the gates are now stochastic. With the specific choice of uh, distribution that they propose um, in, this, in this paper called the hard concrete distribution, we actually have a nice closed form solution for, for the expected L0 norm that is just computed based on the parameters phi of the gates. So this is a nice differentiable function with respect to pi. So now we have a kind of fully differentiable pipeline and uh, we can apply gradient-based optimization to try to learn this sparse network. Uh, just a quick comment, because the model is now stochastic because of the stochastic gates, then we ideally during testing, we might want to have only one uh, network that we will perform evaluation over. So we essentially have to, so the, the theta tilde is not stochastic, but the Z is. So we have to make a choice for how to merge this theta tilde and the stochastic set into one. And the idea is just to choose the gate medians for, for making the, the gates deterministic. So now going back to, so this is our actual proposal. Instead of solving the penalized problem where we're you know, minimizing the loss with this penalized objective and this penalty would be the expected L0 norm, what we're proposing is to consider the problem of training the sparse models as a constraint optimization problem where your objective is the standard loss that we had before, so the expected loss over the stochastic gates. But now instead of adding this as a penalty, we have a constraint on the density of the model. So we're looking at the expected L0 density of the model. We normalize by the number of parameters and we say this has to be less than epsilon. So this epsilon now means the maximum allowed density of the model. And by density, I mean, if, so if epsilon is 100%, then we're allowing all the weights to be active. If epsilon is very small, then we're restricting some of the weights to be turned off. Here, I'm only showing the constraint kind of as a global case where we have only one constraint that covers all the parameters of the model, but you can also set this up with layer-wise constraints. And some of the results that I'll present later have these layer-wise constraints where you might want to enforce a certain kind of density constraint at each of the individual layers of the model. Um, some of the advantages of this method are of course that this epsilon is perhaps easier to tune that, that lambda because now we have this there's more intuitive semantics for what epsilon is trying to represent. Uh, we hope to get more reliable control over the model sparsity. When we set this epsilon, we can check if we're actually satisfying the constraints or not. Um, while when we set lambda, we don't really know what sparsity we're aiming for. And finally, just like the penalized formulation where you could have a, your training loss plus some regularizing for some behavior plus another regularizer for another behavior, you have a similar extensibility in the, in the constraint case where you can, if you want to encode different behaviors, you can put them as additional constraints in your problem. And I want to emphasize here in the standard penalized problem, you're trying to minimize this, this objective that is a mix of the original loss and the penalty. So in a sense, you're trying to minimize this, this sparsity inducing penalty. In the constraint formulation, we're not trying to optimize that. We're only trying to satisfy the, to satisfy the constraints. Once you're, let's say you wanted to achieve 50% sparsity, 
once you're at 45 percent sparsity the contribution of the constraints in a sense is going to stop mattering while when you have this penalized formulation if you have let's say it's, it's counting the number of parameters that you had you're still trying to minimize that objective because the lambda pen if it's fixed and it's non-zero is going to keep affecting the gradient that you're computing at every step so you're going to keep trying to minimize the density of the model so we have we have considered the the specific constraint optimization problem and now the question is okay how do you solve this problem so there's a kind of standard uh, calculus technique for handling this this constraint optimization problems which is to form the Lagrangian associated with the constraint optimization problem which is just the a kind of a linear combination of the objective function and the constraint violations. And now here I'm thinking of, so this lambda would be the Lagrange multipliers for this problem. And I'm thinking of it as a vector because it could have potentially different constraints for the different layers, as I mentioned before. So in the case of a single constraint, this would be you know just a, a scalar lambda variable that multiplies a scalar constraint violation. And now, in comparison to the to the penalized problem that used to be just a minimization over phi uh, over phi and theta tilde, now we have this maximization over lambda, that is essentially dynamically adjusting the value of the Lagrange multipliers uh, depending on the specific choices of the parameters that we have. And there's many different algorithms that could be applied to solve this kind of problem. Uh, you can apply sort of projected gradient descent descent. You can apply an augmented Lagrangian method, this extra gradient techniques with or without extrapolation. And sort of there's a big scaffolding of how to tackle this, this min-max smooth problems. Um, but in this, and for the for the sake of this paper, we're sort of showing that kind of the simplest possible strategy, which is just gradient descent ascent, is uh, is sufficient to, to get reliable solutions. And by gradient descent ascent, I mean that since we're solving a minimization problem on theta tilde and phi, so the model parameters and maximization on Lagrange multipliers, then we have descent on the model parameters, and that's where you have a negative sign. And then we multiply in the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to the model parameters, and we're maximizing, or with a positive sign, the, the Lagrangian with respect to the Lagrange multipliers. So we're accumulating these gradients with a positive sign. And now, because the Lagrange multipliers for these inequality constraints have to be non-zero, uh, non-negative, we're projecting them to be to be non-negative, fairly standard, uh, fairly standard to me. There's two remarks I would like to make about this update. The first one is that, as you can see, the Lagrange multipliers are essentially accumulating the value, the constraint violations over time. So. You start, you start your model, you might initialize the lambda from zero. And the first thing you do is you measure at the first model parameters, what's your constraint violation. And then you accumulate that in lambda. So the, if you're above the constraint level, this term is gonna be positive. So your lambda is gonna increase. If you're below the constraint level, this term is gonna be negative. So lambda is gonna decrease. So if you remain being infeasible, if you keep violating the constraint, the value of lambda is kind of on its own because of the nature of the update going to increase to put more pressure on the optimization dynamics to take the value of the violation down so that you actually become feasible. And uh, importantly, if you look at this update, the only thing that is needed to update the value of lambda is to measure the constraint violations. But you had to measure the constraint violations anyway in the penalized case you had to measure the, say, the expected L0 norm anyway. So besides, you know, this addition of a bunch of scalars here, one for every constraint, there is no extra overhead in trying to solve the constrained version of this sparsity problem as the penalized version. Let me first show this, this plot about the training dynamics of the problem. So for now, let's just concentrate on the orange part of this plot. So I'm showing uh, this is a simple MLP MNIST task for illustration, where we're trying to accomplish 30% uh, density or 70% density, the top and bottom rows. Uh, 
and I'm showing the density of the model. So the expected L0 density, the value of the multiplier at different steps of, of training, as well as the training loss and the validation error. And as you can see here, we start with a fairly dense model. So the, the density is pretty high and the Lagrange multipliers are initialized at zero. So that's the, that's the case for both, for both of these experiments. And since we are trying to get to a 30% density, we're violating the constraint at the beginning. The value of the violation is positive. So the Lagrange multiplier is going to start increasing. And as this Lagrange multiplier starts increasing in value, we start putting more and more pressure on the, on the model to reduce the value of the density. And eventually, once we pass this, this vertical line, which is the point at which we became feasible, uh, now the value of the violation is negative. We're below the constraint level that we wanted to achieve. So the Lagrange multiplier starts decreasing. So this is essentially, in a sense, nothing but the penalized problem, but now the lambda, the lambda parameters are not fixed by us. They're not kind of, and they're not fixed by us, but they're also not frozen. They're not constant throughout the whole optimization. They change dynamically to respond to how much you're violating the constraints. One of the issues with the standard grading descent descent update is that when you start, you usually will not start satisfying the constraints. So you start accumulating all these violations in the Lagrange multiplier. And when you finally become feasible, your Lagrange multiplier usually has accumulated all the violations you had up until that point. So that means that this Lagrange multiplier is still going to make, uh, to have an influence in the grading that you compute for updating the primal parameters, because let me just show you this here. The gradient that you use for updating the primal parameters or the model parameters depends on the value of the Lagrange multiplier that you had. So since the value of the Lagrange multiplier is high, then you're going to have quite, quite a big influence to keep reducing the sparsity. And that's the reason why you see this overshoot down here. So we go way beyond the sparsity that we, that we wanted to accomplish. In the case of the 70% sparsity, we go beyond and then we eventually, we eventually resurface. I, I believe if you were to run these experiments for long enough, the value of the Lagrange multipliers would, would finally decrease to zero and you'll see a resurfacing of the density uh, kind of asymptotically to the desired density. But we don't want to you know, spend time trying to waiting for the Lagrange multiplier to, to get back to a reasonable value. Uh, and the reason that would take some time is that we're kind of just like we accumulated the value to, of the violations to get to, to this high number over here, the way we would go down is by accumulating all the negative violations. And as you can see, that, that behavior is, is relatively slow. So that's where we propose this, this dual restart heuristic. Uh, mostly inspired on, on a game theoretic perspective of this optimization problem. And the idea is that just suppose that you have some values for the primal player, so the model parameters. And you're taking, you're now considering what is the best thing that the Lagrange multiplier, the second player of this game, could have performed. Now, of course, the Lagrange multiplier is going to maximize its objective, which is, which is just this, and it's independent of the objective function. All that matters is whether you were positive or negative. This is just a linear problem with positive or negative terms. If you were above the constraint level, you will want to take the Lagrange multiplier to infinity. If you're exactly at the constraint level, then the Lagrange multiplier is insensitive to, it, it doesn't have any preference. And if you're below the, the constraint level, then of course this term is negative. And since the Lagrange multiplier want to maximize, then the best thing they could do is to get to zero because these Lagrange multipliers cannot be negative. So the, the idea for this dual restart heuristic is to, instead of waiting for the Lagrange multipliers to slowly decrease over time, we check once we're feasible, we're not gonna wait for, for the Lagrange multipliers to go back down to zero, we're gonna set them to zero. So the update is gonna look like this. Um, we perform this, this partial update as usual. We just look at the what the update for the Lagrange multiplier would have been. And then if we are at phi t satisfying the constraints, uh, if we're not satisfying the constraints, then we keep the update as is. But if we are satisfying the constraint, then we don't 
perform you know the negative accumulation we just take the Lagrange multiplier down to zero intuitively you could, you could think of this as the Lagrange multiplier or the dual player not holding a grudge against previous constraint violations if it takes you a long time to become feasible the Lagrange multiplier is going to be fairly high and what we're saying here is once you become feasible just forget about all the accumulated violations just kind of let it go and allow the primal player to keep updating their parameters based on based on the the loss that they have at this point forget about the constraints since we know we're feasible now that's what you see in this blue line over here so this the orange line was kind of the, the standard updates blue is the updates with dual restarts so remember this vertical line was when we first became feasible now instead of allowing the lagrange multipliers to go down slowly by accumulating these negative violations we're going to set it to zero and of course at zero doesn't mean that we're that we became feasible once that will remain feasible and in fact it's we actually slowly jump out of the feasible set we kind of take a little detour from the feasible set and then because we're becoming unfeasible the lagrange multiplier is going to increase again until it becomes feasible again so we kind of touch the feasible set once we roamed around it and then we touched it again and then the lagrange multiplier decreases interestingly we see this sort of like damped oscillations in the lagrange multipliers as well as the density so it's not like we're we became feasible once and then we shot again very very far away from the from the feasible set so we're kind of remaining with this with this nice uh, bounded oscillations and as you can see here this actually allows for for the loss to kind of concentrate the, the model parameters to concentrate and optimizing the loss rather than overshooting the the this the, the size spicy I'd like to take a pause and see if there's any questions up until this point. Hi, Jose. I just have a very quick question that's uh, back to slide 18. Uh, I assume that uh, when we find sparse networks, the constraints are, are not stochastic, right? Yes, that's correct. So in this case, the constraints, mm -hmm. um, so the constraints for the expected L0 norm, they're an expectation, so you might think that they're stochastic, but we have a closed form solution. So in this case, the constraint is not stochastic. But if you have something like, um, maybe you want your model to be fair, uh, or something that depends, let's say, on a mini batch. So you want to somehow constrain the predictions of your model on a specific data point, then those mm -hmm. constraints could be, uh, maybe they're an expectation, but you don't have a closed form solution for that. So you need to estimate the expectation with mm -hmm. samples. And that's where the stochasticity comes in. I see. Uh, and here we are taking expectation because of the uh, latent vector, the latent variable Z, right? Yes. But okay. uh, so it is an expectation, but we don't need to estimate it. We have a closed form solution. So I it's see, not I see. But if okay. let's say this depended on X, then we would need potentially to sample the the constraint, the, the you know, the, the mini batch to estimate the constraint. And when you sample, so if you have an unbiased estimator, then sometimes you're gonna be below and sometimes you're gonna be above. And if you wanted to get to a specific point with this unbiased mm -hmm. estimator, then you can't very easily judge if you're actually satisfying the constraint or not because you have noise in the estimation. I see, I see. Uh, yeah, by, by the way, I do have a question on the uh, on the size 13 where you formulate okay. the um, the sparsity. Uh, so or could you remind us the, uh, what the meaning of the beta, gamma, and the uh, uh, C here? Right. So this beta, gamma, and uh, z uh, come from, from the concrete distribution. So the concrete distribution is, is just this random variable sigma that is just taking a uniform random variable, applying a transformation to it. Um, and uh, this beta is a temperature parameter. The hard concrete distribution, because they want to, so this would be just a distribution with support in 0, 1 open. Now. Mm -hmm. Uh, for sparsity, we actually want exact zeros and exact ones. So the idea of the hard concrete distribution is to take the the density of the of the concrete distribution, the sigma, and stretch it beyond zero, so beyond zero and beyond one. So mm -hmm. this 
uh, set and gamma are, I think, something like 1.1 and minus 0.1. So you want to stretch the density a little bit above those two cases. So now you have a mixed distribution that has mass at zero and mass at one and some density in between. And I see. I see. The beta is just controlling the, the temperature of the distribution. So how peaked is going to be um, around the, the boundaries of the zero one interval. I see. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Could you give a little bit of intuition behind why GDA versus augmented Lagrangian? Um, I, I, I thought you said simplicity at first, but it didn't seem that the augmented Lagrangian would be that much more difficult. So I was wondering if there's something else. Uh, you're right. The, the augmented Lagrangian is not more difficult in, let's say, in computational terms. Uh, there is an extra, um, there's an extra hyperparameter that needs to be tuned for the augmented Lagrangian method, which has to do with this sort of increasing sequence or not, not necessarily monotonically increasing sequence of uh, uh, coefficients for the quadratic term, if you're familiar with, with this. Um, so in principle, it's not necessarily more computationally demanding, but it, you can think of GDA as a specific setting for the augmented Lagrangian method with just no quadratic term. So we, um, I don't remember if we actually, I remember we, give, we did some experiments with extra gradient updates and we didn't see any significant uh, kind of better performance with that fancier style of update. I don't think we uh, necessarily tried the augmented Lagrangian method, uh, but it's in principle not more computationally demanding. So it's a fairly reasonable alternative for trying to solve this problem. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the, I mean, the extra hyperparameter is tuned automatically by itself. It's not like a hand tuned uh, parameter. So, um, anyways, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, it would be interesting to compare. Sure. Thank you for your question, Michael. I'll move on with the rest of the slides. So there, this is a bit of a funny slide. This is a, this slide doesn't actually have anything to do with the constrained um, story that I've been telling so far. So this slide is just two, in a sense, tricks of observations that we saw during our experiments that um, are applicable more generally to the uh, L0 regularization framework that people had previously kind of reported the lack of success in trying to use this L0 regularization for training residual networks. And two things that we observed uh, was that we needed to increase the learning rate of the, the step size of the gates to actually get sparsity in, the, in these residual networks. So both um, a paper by Gale and a paper by Lusos didn't manage to achieve any, any sparsity in these residual networks. And we noticed that just by increasing the size of the, of this, the, of the learning rate for the, for the gate parameters, this phi's over here, um, we're actually able to achieve density at the end. So what this plot is showing is the gate median. So remember, that's, that's the, the way to make the gates deterministic for test time. And at the end of training, between using a training with a small learning rate of 0 0.1 and a larger learning rate of six. And when you kind of choose this larger learning rate, you get to an actually peak distribution where you have actual sparsity in the gates. While if you train with the smaller learning rate, you don't actually get any sparsity. Your model, your model gates kind of slowly decrease over time, but this is already at the end of training. You don't get any sparsity, any kind of effective sparsity where you can zero out some of these gates. In this, in this specific case, this, since this is the median, this is the value that we would use to multiply it, to multiply the, the free magnitudes theta tilt. So if this is because this is 0 0.8, is not zero. So we actually keep that weight and we actually keeping mo most of the weights. So more generally for the, for the L0 regularization framework, one kind of useful trick was to just increase the size of the learning rate to actually achieve sparsity. And um, now this one has to do with kind of the controllability of the 
of the density that we achieve at the end, we notice that when you use weight decay with this reparameterized weights, the one way to reduce the weight decay is to either reduce the magnitude of the weights, so reduce the value of theta tilde, or to reduce the value of the, to reduce the probability of the weight being active. And in this particular paper, we're using structure sparsity. So we have one gate for a whole unit of a fully connected layer or for a whole channel of a convolutional layer. So when you turn off a gate, you're turning off the contribution from a large amount of parameters. So what we observed is that if you don't stop the, the gradient of the weight decay from modifying the value of the sparsity of the, of the gate parameters, you will end up getting a lot more sparsity than you desired just because turning off parameters is a useful way to reduce the L2 norm of the weights, even though what you wanted to do with the with weight decay was to reduce the magnitude of the weights, not kind of cheat by trying to turn off these gates because of the reparameterization. So what this plot is showing here is that when you perform the detaching, so this is the same um, we're trying to train a model to achieve a 70% density. When you don't detach, you go way beyond the desired value of the density. And this is not a flaw of the constraint optimization algorithm. It's a flaw of the weight decay uh, structure that is allowed to reduce the, you know, the magnitude, the L2 norm of the weights by just turning off gates. But if you were to detach this gradient, so you let the weight decay affect the magnitudes of the weights, but not the gates of the model, you actually achieve the desired density. So this was more kind of engineering experimental observation that was necessary in our, in our experiments. And I would like to spend maybe a few more minutes talking about the, the actual results of, of the technique that we propose. So this is the same style of plot that I that I showed uh, at the very beginning of the presentation. This is showing for several different kind of style of architectures from fully connected convolutional and, and residual models, comparing the behavior that you would get between a constraint and penalized objectives. Um, and the constraint optimization is, is, we call it controllable because as I mentioned before, when you ask for a specific amount of sparsity, you actually achieve that, that amount of sparsity. That's why this, this kind of diagonal line, all those blue dots are aligned with the diagonal line. You get the sparsity that they wanted. And we also show that the behavior of the brittleness of the penalty coefficient lambda pen is not unique to a specific kind of architecture. It, it can happen for all these different architectures which makes the search of a reasonable value of lambda pen to achieve a desired value of the target density uh, very challenging. And of course, the bigger these architectures, the more expensive each of these kind of training loops for evaluating a specific lambda pen would be. So the more prohibitive it becomes to try to do this manual tuning of lambda pen. Now, of course, just achieving controlled sparsity is not kind of a goal on its own because you could have just you know, perform something called magnitude pruning that just takes some of the parameters and just turns them off and potentially retrains the network. And you can set exactly how many parameters you want to turn off. So you can get exactly the, the density or sparsity that you wanted, but you also don't want to compromise performance in doing so. And so all these plots are displaying the performance of these different models in comparison with the, with the penalized objective and what we're showing here is, of course, we don't know where the penalized objective density is going to end before we run the experiment. But when we set a specific value of lambda pen, we can run the experiment, check what density it was. And we see that the performance that we get from the constrained uh, method, that would be the blue dot that is actually hidden behind this red star, is essentially the same as that of the, as that of the penalized method. So we're getting this extra controllability and the sparsity, but we're not sacrificing any uh, performance in doing so. And this can be seen both in terms of the actual total counter parameters or the total kind of multiply accumulation uh, operations or like flops of the model. And that's, you get a similar trend 
both for C410 and for, for Tiny ImageNet, where we get very similar uh, performance for a network that have a, a sort of normalized parameter count with respect to the penalized map. And we actually observe a similar pattern uh, on ImageNet. So in this case, we decided not to, not to use the penalized method as our baseline for ImageNet, uh, because of course the, the ImageNet experiments are more expensive than all the previous experiments that I had mentioned before, and trying to tune to have a sort of um, equivalent value of the density uh, for the penalized objective would just be too prohibitive. So what we did was use as a baseline the L1 magnitude pruning, so some structured uh, magnitude pruning that would look at a pre-trained model. You study the, the magnitude of the groups of parameters. So let's say you look at the whole parameters associated to a unit of your fully connected layers, and you sort them by their magnitude, in this case, the L1 norm of these parameters, and you chop whatever percentage uh, you don't want. So in this case, at a density of 90%, you would be chopping 10% of the lower, um, let's say, rows of your fully connected layers or specific slices of your convolutional tensors. Um, and what we see here is that the constrained approach can actually get um, comparable, if not slightly better performance than the L1 magnitude pruning approach. And something important to note here is that this is even after fine tuning the magnitude pruning method. So normally when you apply magnitude pruning, your, your model weights need to be fine tuned. So we perform fine tuning on that model that was already trained for the L1 magnitude pruning rows and we fine tune for a certain number of epochs and we see that um, sort of you get slow, slowly diminishing returns the more you fine tune, uh, but we can get slightly better performance for the constrained approach, uh, both now with the model-wise and layer-wise cases. So that's kind of something I would like to emphasize here. The, this experiments that I'm showing in this in this in this plot and specifically for ImageNet have either only one constraint model wise or you can have a layer wise constraint and in this case i think we have something around 48 constraints so we're able to solve these non-convex uh, constraint uh, constraint problems with many many but a relatively large number of constraints and actually achieve the density that we wanted so we were aiming for 70 percent density we get that seven, sorry, 50% density, we get that 50% density, which is of course um, kind of guaranteed by the magnitude pruning technique. So just to summarize, the constraint, this constraint formulations enable us to get direct control over the model sparsity and have uh, clear interpretability for the hyperparameters. And we can do all of this without compromising on performance uh both computationally and in kind of the accuracy or predictive performance of the models i would like to spend uh, a little bit of time briefly talking about about um, cooper but i'll be happy to take some questions on the kind of the paper part of the talk if there's any remaining questions so far Then I'll give you a quick primer to Cooper, which is a library that after, after writing all the code for the different experiments of this, of this paper that I just presented, we realized that most of the code that we had for these experiments was pretty much independent of all the, the sparsity um, nitty gritty. So we decided to outsource, to open source that code and put it all into a nice uh, package library for for solving this constraint optimization problems. Um, essentially, our philosophy is that we, we want to have a general purpose solver for, for potentially non-convex deep learning problems. So there are some existing alternatives. And if you're curious, you can go check on our website. You'll, you'll see a list of, of other relevant constraint optimization libraries that exist specifically for PyTorch. Um, but usually you would need some sort of assumptions on the type of constraints that you're working with. So you would have either convex constraints or you would have constraints on perhaps positive definite matrices, or you have you maybe need a, a 
efficient primal oper uh, um, an efficient proximal operator some some sort of assumptions of the constraints and uh, what we wanted to to enable with this library is to not have any assumptions on the constraints of course that comes with potentially no guarantees on what kind of solutions you're getting from from running the optimization methods but at least um, from a practitioner's perspective it's useful to have this this no assumptions uh, sort of alternatives so you can quickly prototype some ideas um, we have we have a fairly comprehensive um, documentation for the different uh, solvers that we have uh, enabled and the different formulations of the constraint optimization problem. I just quickly want to show you what the code for this paper, uh, for the constrained sparsity paper, looks like in the language of Cooper. So essentially, the one of our core objects are called CMPs or constraint minimization problems. Uh, you define a CMP by by setting a, sp a special function called compute CMP state that is going to evaluate the, the value of the loss. So this would be the cross entropy loss and measure the, the constraint violations at every, at every step. And within the CMP problem, there is this object called the constraint group that essentially just groups a bunch of constraints of similar nature. So in this case, I'm thinking of layer wise constraints. So we would have one constraint for each of the sparse layers of the model. And when we measure the constraint violations, we just measure the, the density of a specific layer and we see how far off we are from the target density. And we package that into this constraint state and we return that into this wrapper CMP state object. That's the kind of the big picture for what a CMP or a constraint minimization problem object looks like. And when you actually want to solve it, uh, this looks is fairly similar to what you would normally do in PyTorch. So you set up your primal optimizers. And as I mentioned before, we observe some improvements by changing the learning rate of the gate parameters. Uh, in this case, it's not higher learning rate, but an altogether different optimizer. Um, but you can you know, set up different optimizers for your, for your primal variables. You set up a dual optimizers for the for the for the multipliers, and then you build this Cooper optimizer. That in this case, it's just a simultaneous constraint optimizer that is going to once you have the loss and constraint violations, perform this update on the this simultaneous update on both of the uh, both of the variables, and you use this just like a standard uh, torch optimizer. So you compute you zero out your gradients, you compute your loss, in this case, the loss is the Lagrangian. You populate the gradients by making a call to backward and you apply an optimizer step. And you repeat this process over all the mini patches in your data loader. So the goal was to make it fairly self-contained and straightforward for, for users that are already familiar with, uh, with PyTorch. There's a bunch of other, of other techniques, different ways to solve the problem ways to sample constraints or use non-differentiable constraints. Um, uh, I'll let you, if you're curious, um, check, out, check out the website. And if you're interested in using this, feel free to reach out. If you're interested in contributing, also feel free to reach out. We'd be very happy to hear from you. And thank you so much for coming to my talk. Thank you, Jose, for this great talk. Let me.